Number nine, construct your own problem. Consider an amusement park ride in which participants are rotated about a vertical axis in a cylinder with vertical walls. Once the angular velocity reaches its full value, the floor drops away and friction between the walls and the riders prevent them from sliding down. Construct a problem in which you calculate the necessary angular velocity that assures the riders will not slide down the wall. Include a free body diagram of a single rider. Among the variables to consider are the radius of the cylinder and the coefficients of friction uh, between the rider's clothing and the wall. All right, so the problem's over here on the right. It says calculate the angular velocity necessary to keep the person from sliding down the wall if the coefficient of static friction is 0.2 and the radius of the path is, is three meters. All right, so here's our picture. Right, this amusement park ride is kind of like the Gravitron, if you've ever been on something like that. Right, it's like a big uh, cylinder-shaped thing, right, where you're going to rotate around here. All right, this is a side view. I know my picture is fantastic, but, um, you know, if you can kind of envision that cylinder and you're on the outside of the cylinder and you're going around and 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 around, and around. all right, that would be the Gravitron. Um, and... Uh, here we have now a top view of the Gravitron as if you were looking down, you know, from the from an aerial perspective. Here's the middle and the person is on the periphery of the path, which is a circle that is created. And that radius will be three meters, as I detailed And the coefficient of static friction here between the person's clothing and the wall is 0.2. So let's talk about all the forces that are acting on this particular person. So first, we're going to draw a free body diagram. So first, what are some forces acting on the person? Well, weight, right? I mean, that's a force basically in most every problem, right? It's occurring on some planet, I'm assuming, that the weight ooh, points straight down. Let me try this one more time. Okay, I, I lied one more. That's good enough. So the weight of this person is pointing straight down, right? And their weight will be equal to mg. Okay, now, um, since... Right. If the floor drops away, okay, uh, that means that, and they're not going to slide down the wall. That must mean that there's something opposing this force of equal but opposite magnitude because they're not moving and accelerating at all. So therefore, that would be considered the frictional force, right? And I'll call it the force of static friction. Now that should exactly oppose the weight, right? For the reasons I just discussed, and the magnitude is equal, so it should be equal to mg, right? But it's just an opposite direction, meaning it's pointing up. Okay, great. So now, um, in order for a frictional force to be present, what do we need? We need a normal force, okay? So in this particular problem, right, you're thinking about the forces acting on this person. And if you think about it, um, right, if you've ever been in a, in a contraption like this, you realize you kind of get pushed back into the wall, okay? So as you're getting pushed back into the wall, which kind of would be uh, this force here, the wall is pushing back on you. Newton's third law, equal but opposite in magnitude. So therefore, the normal force is pointing here because this is the force acting on you by the wall. Okay, that is the normal force. All right, great. So now we have a pretty uh, detailed diagram here. So um, let's start creating some formulas. All right, that uh, we... Re we realize, right, all we really know in this problem is going to be the coefficient of static friction and the radius. So somehow I got to get a formula with both of them in it. Okay, I'm going to start with the frictional uh, force formula. Okay, if you remember from the prior chapter, right, that will be the, uh, for, the force of static friction is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. Okay, great. So now, um, now that I know, right, that uh, I have, I do have this value, the static uh, frictional coefficient, but I don't yet know this value, right? And I also have some values for the force of static friction. Remember, I know that it's equal to mg. So what I'll do now is I'll just start plugging in, I'll just plug in mg here, all right? Less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. So here we have to realize something about this normal force, all right? Um, none of the questions have gotten to this, but if you notice this diagram, right, the diagram seems to be unbalanced in the x direction. There seems to be a net force pointing to the left. Now, if there's a net force pointing to the left, what does that mean in terms of an acceleration? 
Ah, that means that there is an acceleration, right? So there must be some acceleration. I'll actually put it down here. There must be some acceleration pointing to the left or pointing to the center of the circle. Guess what that acceleration is called? That's a special name. Has a special name. It's called the centripetal acceleration. All right. So, mm, okay. All right. So wait a minute. If this is the normal force and I have an acceleration in that same direction, how can I relate now these two variables? Right? How is force related? Basically, I'm asking, how is force related to acceleration? Oh, well, force is related to acceleration by saying something like this, right? Some of the forces is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration. That's, this is how they're related. They're related via the mass. Okay. So in this particular case, all I'm going to do is instead of writing some of the forces, right? Because this is really the only force here in that X direction that is acting on the person. So all I'm going to now do here is I'm going to substitute the normal force in. And that should equal mass times the centripetal acceleration. All right, that is basically the formula over here on the right-hand side. If you notice this, you see centripetal force. Ah, so wait, the normal force here is the centripetal force. All right, so uh, this is basically the equation I just detailed, all right, without really using it. But I'm going to keep it in, it doesn't really matter which one we choose, they're, they're the same thing. But I'm going to keep it in terms of this because what I want to do is show you explicitly how I'm going to substitute in uh, the mass times the centripetal acceleration in for the normal force, okay? So this gets plugged in here. Okay, let's, re uh, let's rewrite it. So that's mu. So mg less than or equal to coefficient of static friction. Make that a little neater. Coefficient of static friction multiplied now by the mass multiplied by the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so I did this, right? I realized that I can cancel the masses, so now this kind of simplifies a little more. So I have gravity less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the centripetal acceleration. So why did I do this? Why did I, why was I thinking about a centripetal acceleration? Well, I also, I, I know it's present in the problem because I do have a uh, force pointing towards the center and the acceleration that points to the center of circular motion has a special name that's called centripetal acceleration. But I realized somehow, remember, I, I always have this in the back of my mind, I have to somehow incorporate the radius into my formula. So, you know, thinking a couple of steps ahead, um, I, I'm realizing that I know a relationship between centripetal acceleration and uh, radius, it just will take me a couple of steps. Okay. Namely, if you look at now this equation, oh, look at that, I have centripetal acceleration and I have the radius. Okay, so that looks very good to me. So now what I'm going to do is now I'm thinking to myself, well, I got to get rid of the centripetal acceleration somehow. I got to get radius or how is radius related to centripetal acceleration? And here it is. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in V squared over R for the centripetal acceleration because they're equal to one another. So now it becomes a coefficient of static friction times V squared over R. Okay, now I'm almost there, right? Do not confuse this. This is not angular velocity. That's tangential velocity. Okay, don't confuse them. Now, though, I realize, okay, great. I finally got radius, you know, the radius into my calculation. But wait a minute. I know this. I know this. I don't know this. Nor do I even want to know that, right? It's asking me for angular velocity. So the next thing in my mind is, well, do I know any relationships between tangential velocity and angular velocity. And I say, yes, I do, right? I do. Here it is. I do know the relationship. Tangential velocity is equal to the radius times omega, which is the angular velocity. So I say, great. Now I can substitute that in for V. So what I'm going to do now is less than or equal to coefficient of static friction multiplied by the radius times the angular velocity. Remember that's squared because I plug it in for V all divided by R. Now just kind of distribute the square, okay? So I realize I have r ooh, I have r squared, omega squared, all over r. Let's simplify things a little bit, all right? This r goes bye bye, as long as uh, along with one of those. So now I have g less than or equal to coefficient of static friction uh, multiplied now by r omega squared. 
And I want to now, remember, solve this whole thing. We're trying to calculate the angular velocity. So now my goal is to solve this equation for omega. So simply divide out now. Hold on, divide out now the coefficient of static friction and the radius. Coefficient of static friction and the radius, and we get it down to now, right? G divided by coefficient of static friction times the radius. Well, now, well, not equal, but it's less than or equal to the uh, angular velocity squared, and I realize I got to square root both, right? So, lo and behold, now I have my formula, and I'm going to write it up here in yellow. So now I have omega will be equal to, or less, or I should say, uh, greater than or equal to, right? Um, the square root of g over coefficient of static friction times r. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Look at this. I have a relationship now with those variables in it. And guess what I just need to do now? I just need to plug it on in. Now you can change this greater than or equal to to just equal to, right? Because this is basically the uh, minimum angular acceleration. So it can be any value that we calculate and above, because that's the meaning of greater than or equal to. So you can leave it, nah, I'll just leave it like this, all right? So we got 9.80 all over the coefficient, which was 0.2, the radius, which was three, and we find that omega, I keep wanting to do that, omega is greater than or equal to square root of 9.8 divided by 0.2 times three, and 4.04, .04. so we get a value of 4.04 .04 radians per second. Those are the units of angular velocity. And that is the answer, given my values of static friction being 0.2 and the radius being 3. So here, you know, this is kind of why physics is a little interesting, I think. Uh, not, not a little, I think it is interesting, but you can take a, a complex problem with, you know, what seems like not enough information work through all the relationships, think about all the interconnections, and we boil it down to a very straightforward, simple problem, right? It, it's just it's just this equation, that's it. So anyway, guys, um, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it very much. I do hope this helped. Please do remember to subscribe. That would be awesome. It allows us to help more students, reach more um, students just like yourself. And um, yeah, I look forward to helping you with the next question. Take care now.